All right, good afternoon, everyone. It is Thursday, February 11th, and this is the joint meeting of the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee and the Health and Human Services Committee. We're uh, receiving an update on two important items. The first is a COVID, is COVID rental assistance, um, the, a lot of associated issues with evictions, and, and our rental assistance package, and we have a significant new appropriation from the federal government. Um, and then second, a update on the planning for the new emergency homeless shelter. And um, we will invite our lead for homeless issues, uh, Evan Glass, to chair um, the meeting uh, after we, as we work our way through. Um, Co-chair Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reamer. I want to um, express my appreciation to Councilmember Glass, who is our lead on homeless issues. As we know, there is an eviction, there's a tsunami of evictions on the horizon. Uh, I also happen to serve on the Public Safety Committee, and it's the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office who is responsible for carrying out the ordinance of evictions within our community. And there are literally hundreds uh, in the queue right now and as soon as the emergency declaration is lifted by the governor, um, a shot clock will begin because our body uh, extended beyond uh, the emergency designation um, an additional term of time before people would actually in fact be evicted. But the numbers of families in the queue is growing by the day. Uh, and obviously once those evictions are administered, that will inevitably lead to homelessness among uh, too many of our families. And so uh, I want to uh, express my appreciation to Councilmember Glass, also a member of our HHS committee, uh, who has taken his role as lead on these issues very seriously uh, and has been doing an outstanding job. And of course, I enjoy working with my colleague and friend, Councilmember Rice. The three of us participated in a point and time count last year. Uh, and I know Councilmember Glass participated in another one recently. Um, and so we look forward to of the discussion this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to you uh, and then yield to Council Member Glass. Okay, so we have a, a, a packet with a lot of issues um, for rental assistance and evictions. Um, I'm, we're just gonna let you uh, take the conversation, Council Member Glass, and um, otherwise it'll be rather confusing with two chairs as well. So you go ahead and uh, guide us through this packet with staff and council members can indicate to Evan Glass if they would like to speak. Uh, well, well, thank you very much to my colleagues uh, and Chair Reamer and Chair Albernaz and, and uh, fellow council members Friedson and Rice and committee members. Um, so, so I, I, I know that uh, for many of us over the last 10 months, uh, one of the number one requests that we've all received is uh, people contacting us uh, asking for rental support, uh, expressing concern. So main focus of today's conversation is to have a conversation about what the status of our rental financial support has been. And then um, equally, if not more important, uh, what we can expect coming up with the uh, eviction cliff that so many are talking about that once rental protections expire and courts fully reopen, uh, by national and local estimates, it's somewhere around the number of 13 to 15% of renters who are, are behind on the rent. And the work that we are all doing is, is to prevent that cliff from coming as best we can, or at least to, to limit its impact. So this is a, uh, a full committee work session today, lots of information to dive into, um, but it is a very timely one. Uh, and so uh, an update on the $20 million that we've allocated, a discussion on how we want the $31 million we're gonna be getting from the federal government, um, and then a few additional conversations about the services to end and prevent homelessness. So with that, um, does anyone else, any of my colleagues have any comments they'd like to make? Or we'll hop right in. Okay, um, turn to um, Ms. McMillan. You wanna kick us off and walk us through this packet? Yes, good afternoon. So the first item for you to have your update discussion on will be with representatives from the Sheriff's Office. Captain Lewis is here and also Frank Vital is here from Legal Aid. Um, and of course, uh, DHHS and DHCA are also on board. 
Captain Lewis has some slides to present. Uh, I think Mary, if you can get them up, that would be great. And she will walk you through her presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody is doing well. Um, again, my name is Captain Robin Lewis. I'm with the Sheriff's Office. And one of the sections in the Sheriff's Office that I oversee is the eviction section. Um, I just have a short PowerPoint here um, to share with you guys just to um, help explain the process of the evictions through the Sheriff's Office and a little bit of information of post COVID and, and now why we're actually during COVID. Um, if you could go to the first screen, please. This kind of just is a quick little overview, something that um, we have our deputies explain to tenants that call in when they have questions. Um, pretty much it's the, the uh, how the process goes. Most of you probably already know, but I'm not sure of the outside audience, so I'll just explain real quick that the landlord begins with an eviction proceeding. Um, they'll file it with the court. Um, summonses will be served on the tenants in person, uh, but, but generally speaking, they're posted on the front door by the sheriff's office, and we also mail a copy to the tenant's address. So both steps are taken, they're both mailed and posted on the front door. Um, there'll be a hearing. We always recommend that everybody be on time, and we advise them that they don't show up at the hearing that the landlord will probably win the case. Um, we explain to them that the hearing gives them a chance to tell their side of the story. And if the judge fa rules in favor of the landlord, within five working days, the landlord can file a case with the court for an eviction. Um, that'll call, be called a writ of restitution, um, sometimes a writ of possession. On the date of the eviction, um, the sheriff's office deputies will come out to the rental unit. Um, and that they will order everybody, the tenant and everyone inside the property to leave. Uh, the landlord and the police can then, um, their designee will then remove all the property from the unit and place it on the right of way. The sheriff's office will supervise all that while it's taking place. But once the property is moved from the unit and the sheriff's office leave, it is the tenant's responsibility for the property. Um, if we go to the next screen, please. This kind of gives a little timeline of the process. Um, so usually tenants, the landlords usually give about um, two, sometimes three months unpaid rent before they actually go to the courts to file for their cases. So they'll have a hearing, landlord case will file in district court. Uh, once there's a ruling, the notices will be mailed to the sheriff's office. Uh, we will process them. We will, we will then place them in envelopes and mail them to the tenants and then physically go out and post them on the doors. Um, there's a hearing date. Uh, if the judge rules in favor, he'll grant either a judgment for possession or the writ of restitution. Um, that paperwork will be sent over to the sheriff's office and it'll be in our possession. The sheriff's office will not go forward with an eviction until the landlord calls to schedule an eviction. And you'll see some on the future screens that will show you that the majority of the writs that the sheriff's office receives um, go with no action being taken. Um, so we wait for the landlord to call. And the reason there's no action taken is because most of those cases, the landlord will work something out um, with the tenants or maybe DHSS will come in and assist uh, or the, the tenant has moved prior to the landlord scheduling the eviction. Um, we will post a notice on the door at least 10 days prior to the eviction taking place. And I will show you an example. We have that on one of the screens. So you can read what's on those notices. Um, and if we go to the next screen, please. So this is the notice of the final notice the vacate that we post on the doors. Um, it kind of gives a little background from the beginning. It lets the tenants know that there has been a writ issued against them. Um, it lets them know what we're going to do, that that their property be placed on the right of way, that, that the locks will be changed, and only the landlord will have access to the premise. Um, and on the end, on the very bottom, it also gives them information how to contact 311. So if they need assistance, um, if they're looking for either rental assistance or just information on what their rights are and what they can do, uh, they do have the ability. We give them the, the email and the number. Um, this notice is posted 
in both English and also in Spanish. Um, and our number is always on the bottom of it. We get plenty of phone calls. We refer them also out to um, either 311 or to di different um, DHS. If, they, if we know who they need assistance from, we'll do that. There are also many occasions where we'll take their information um, and we will actually call some of the social workers directly and explain to them the case to see if they can help. So our deputies are instructed to talk to people about um, mental health issues, um, the elderly, you know, if there's young kids, if there's anybody disabled in the home. We try to get as much information as we can from the landlords so that we can ascertain whether there's further assistance needed prior to us showing up. On many occasions, we will actually take um, the mobile crisis team out with us. So they will be there when for assistance also if needed. If we can go to the next screen, please. So this is just the same notice, but in Spanish, they're back-to-back -back notices that we post. And then the next screen. So this is just an overview of, the, of how many evictions we do in our fiscal year. Um, I know part of my screen is cut off, but let's focus down on FY 2020. This is just to explain that LNG cases that are filed with the court. So in FY 2020, which was mostly pre-COVID, we did have about three months of COVID involved in that. There were 40,645 cases that were filed with the district court for failure to pay rent. Um, you can see that quite a few defendants do not appear. It's over a thousand of defendants and it's pretty typical that don't appear for their hearings. Um, you see there's a percentage of 18% of the writs that are actually filed at uh, failure to pay rent cases that are actually filed and go to completion to become a writ. The sheriff's office received that year 7,984 um, writs out of those 40,000, um, we actually conducted 591 evictions, which is 7.4% of the total number of evictions, total number of the 40,000 um, that, were, that were given out. So this shows you, if you look at the prior years, the percentage is pretty much the same between eight and 7% of what we actually go forward and have to physically conduct an eviction on. And we'll see when the next slide or two that this is pretty much the average of what occurred for um, during COVID also, although the numbers have been considerably lower. So if we can go to the next screen, please. So this is just another layout. Some people are um, chart people. Um, the blue shows the LNT cases that were filed with the court system. Captain Lewis? Yes, sir. Uh, I see Chair Reamer had a question or comment. Just sure. quick clarification. So if I saw that last table correctly, it was 40,000 40, plus, you know, 47, 48,000 issued only, you know, 13, 14, 1,500 defendants show up in court. Is that right? Am I reading that right? That is correct. And I, and I think um, some of the other individuals that are might be on this call that work with the court, they, they'll tell you the same thing. The majority of the people do not show up for their court hearings. That, that is considerably a problem. Thank you. Sure. Um, so this will just show again that the, the blue is the cases filed, the orange are the cases that the sheriff's office receive, and the gray is the percentage of what we go forward and actually have to, um, you know, place people out on the street. And next screen, please. Again, just another chart showing it. The blue on this one is how many the sheriff's office received, and the orange just gives you a little better view of how many evictions we, we physically have to go forward with. Next screen, please. So um, these are the some of the cases that we're doing during COVID. So during COVID right now, um, the only evictions we're going forward are on are the emergency evictions. So um, I just wanted to break them down, um, breach of lease, um, occurs when a tenant commits one or more substantial lease violation. Um, in response, the landlord may file a complaint for repossession of the rental property against the tenant. Um, and then in this order, they, this is how they seek an eviction for this. And an example, a tenant fails to pay rent on the agreed upon schedule, breaks a rule as laid out in the, in the, in the contract, 
conducting legal activity on the property or is responsible for significant damage. We see a lot of it for the significant damage. That's a lot of the breach of leases that we're seeing right now. The next one is the tenant holding over, um, which is a tenant who remains on possess on, in possession of the lease property after the expiration of the lease term and when the landlord wishes to repossess the lease premise. The only difference in this lease violation is that there, there, may, there does not have to be a lease violation to prove in court to obtain this eviction. So as an example of a tenant who continues to pay his rent, even after the lease has expired, but the landlord doesn't wish him to be there anymore. Um, the tenant, the landlord can then file a tenant holding over. And then lastly is a forcible entry detainer is a person enters the real property of another without legal authority or by force um, or refuses to surrender possession of the property. So this could be a squatter. It can even be where the leased person moves somebody into the home. They leave. They know their lease has expired. The other person remains in the property. Therefore, you know, labeled as a squatter. The next page, please. So this is a little bit of what's been happening during COVID. So this is January through December of 2020. Um, wanted to show that there had been 24,358 cases for failure to pay rent filed with the district court. The sheriff's office has received 3,022 writs from the court to proceed for evictions. Uh, out of those, the amount of landlords that have called to schedule evictions have been 325. And we actually went forward with 300, two, so I'm sorry, 235 evictions that were actually conducted out of the 3,000 that we received. And if we were to do the percentage, it falls right around the, I think, 7.4 or something, 7.8%, um, which is in line with typically how many landlords file cases and how many go away prior to the sheriff's office needing to conduct any evictions. Um, next screen, please. So just a little chart um, kind of explaining what we just went over um, to see that the low percentage that we actually have to go forward. And, and out of those 235, quite a few of those are just us going out and changing the locks. So those, those are not us physically removing that many people from the premises. Um, many times the landlord, the tenants will leave and not turn in their keys. In order for it to be a valid eviction, the landlord has to have us come out, um, search the apartment, and then change the locks. So, so out of those, the percentage of the people that were put on the street are even smaller. Um, next screen. I think that was the end of it. I'm open for any questions. My contact information is there. I also have the number for the eviction section if anybody um, has any future questions or anything. And thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, Captain Lewis, for that information. Um, you know, clearly the, the numbers that you just shared, uh, nearly 24,000, uh, you know, eviction notices that have gone out. Um, I would consider that still quite a lot for what I thought was an eviction moratorium. Now, granted, it's not the nearly 40, 41,000 that, that we had last year. Um, but diving a bit deeper, I appreciate you sharing the three criteria for what can proceed during an eviction moratorium, the emergency evictions, you know, breach of lease, tenant holdover, and forcible entry of detainer. Um, so I, I'm just curious, I don't know if you can answer this, if, if those are the three big categories of what can move forward, um, it seems to me like anything can really move forward. It's just the will of the landlord, right? The discretion of the landlord. Well, they, they have to go through the judge. Um, the judge has to um, show that it's, that falls in those criteria and that a landlord is not using this just to, to sidetrack and get his eviction. Okay. Well, it, it still shows that there's a lot more work that we have to do here, right? And support services, particularly if people are going through the process and um, very few of them are actually showing up, right? When it gets to that point in the process. So, so they're quite vulnerable, uh, vulnerable through the process and vulnerable uh, at this point in time uh, through the pandemic as well. Uh, I, I invite my colleagues to text me if they wanna speak. Um, uh, Chair Albernaz, you're up. 
Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Captain Lewis, for that presentation. I know it's, it's an incredibly emotional division to have to, to, to manage, so, so I appreciate that. And I know that there is great sensitivity given to working as collaboratively as possible with the Department of Health and Human Services to make referrals. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that process? You mentioned in your presentation that contacts when you see in a home when in particular there's somebody vulnerable, I mean, everyone's vulnerable, but in particular children, youth, seniors, folks with disabilities. Can you describe a little bit more what that referral process looks like working with HHS and uh, referencing services that may be available to the families who are in this situation? Certainly. Um, so, so the deputies um, do outreach calls prior to the evictions. Um, they outreach with either the attorneys or the tenants. I mean, I'm sorry, or the landlords. Um, and they do that several times. And each time they, they continue to ask questions to see if they could find something out about the, the tenants that are inside. Depending on what, what they're told, they will sometimes go out and drive by the residents and, and possibly speak to the tenants ahead of time. Um, a lot of times it's something that they, they don't find out till the day of the eviction and maybe they go out there and they see that there's a vulnerable adult at the residence that they're not comfortable um, putting out on the street. Um, or they see their young kids and they know that the mother doesn't have any place to go with the kids. So each, each deputy has um, the phone number in their cell phones for HHS. Um, they know according to where they are in the county as to which social worker they can reach out to. And um, they make the phone call um, and either place the, the tenant on the phone with the social worker or they talk to the deputy and the social worker will talk. Most of the time, it'll be the tenant, if they're, if they're able to, um, will speak to the social worker directly and they'll work something out, whether it's they're working at a payment and maybe they'll be able to cut a check and the eviction will be stopped. Um, housing, they work out housing, they'll work out um, providing a moving truck so that the belongings can be moved. So maybe the family has another relative to go to, they'll help provide transportation for the belongings to that place. Um, so it really depends on the circumstance as to, to what type of help is, is needed or that we require. I appreciate that. You know, um, th this council unanimously supported legislation last year that enhance the mobile crisis units, adding social workers specifically within districts to address 911 calls that might come in with someone who's in crisis. Um, I think there may be an opportunity for us to expand what you just described to something more comprehensive in partnership with HHS in which we have almost like a mobile crisis unit, in addition to the referral of the phone number and the warm handoff to a social worker, but that they're potentially, particularly when there are uh, situations involving children, youth, elders, people with disabilities, even less likely to identify or you know, uh, find some place to go. Um, I'd, I'd like to explore that, Ms. McMillan, as a follow-up to HHS uh, and see. And, and I'm also curious as to once those referrals are made to HHS, how they're tracked, uh, where they fall in the queue or the system, because um, clearly the folks that are being referred, as I keep saying, are in crisis um, and, and obviously do need some uh, significant level of, of um, support. The other question I have, I've always been meaning to ask this, one of the most heartbreaking things that any of us see is the mound of personal items, um, the, the furniture, the pictures, the, you know, that you see literally on the side of the street. Um, it, it's obviously emotional for everybody involved, but clearly most directly the people who are being impacted. Um, what, what, why do we do that? Um, how does that work? Um, and, and what, what's the, how did, how does that work? Um, I, I just, I've always been curious as to, to why that is and, and what happens. I mean, I know why it is. I mean, somebody's being evicted from their home because they haven't, but, but that's just, it's so, and, and I see people picking through um, oftentimes when you see these situations, it's just awful for everyone involved. So, so in our county, we're required that all the belongings, all their personal belongings are removed from the home 
Um, and we do require that the moving crews have um, industrial trash bags in boxes. So there, there was a point years ago where um, maybe the, the crews didn't um, handle it with as much dignity as they could. So, so now we, we have put in provisions that things are done a little neater. Um, so it's not look, it doesn't look like they're just taking stuff and putting stuff out on the street. I can tell you that there are other counties like in Baltimore, um, and I believe in DC where they do lockouts. Um, I don't know a lot about that, but that's where the, the sheriff's office will go do an eviction, but essentially we're just removing the people. Um, or in DC it's the marshals and then they lock the door. All the property stays in and then the tenants have to come back at a late, later time and make arrangements with the landlord to get their property. Um, I see problems with both. Um, you know, a, a lot of issues and a lot probably of uh, police calls when tenants either want to get the property and they can't get it for another week or two. Um, you know, the, the problems that occur, whereas we're going out and at least they have the ability to get their stuff then. Um, and we will wait, if they have a truck there, we'll have the movers uh, that the landlords are providing, we will have them move the stuff to the truck. Um, even if the truck comes after the fact, we will have the crew move everything and put it on the truck. Um, so we do what we can to assist, but that's just how the laws are here in Maryland. Um, I it might be, I'm sensing potentially an OLO report here, or just some best practices that are out there, um, you know, just to see what more we can do, because the dignity aspect of it obviously is significant. Um, so I, Want to think more about that, but um, I yield back to you uh, for now, Councilmember Glass. Uh, I, I appreciate the point you just raised. Uh, certainly, something to think about whether uh, giving someone access to all of their life's material uh, and property uh, at the risk of having the entire community know about what's going on versus uh, preserving some dignity but locking them out of of all of their material for uh, for a week or two. Uh, and, and I also really appreciate the HHS chair uh, mentioning the, the mobile crisis team and that Captain Lewis said that after, just correct me if I'm wrong, after the 12 week, presumably the 12 week eviction process, at the very end of that, the mobile crisis team does go out and is on, on hand should they be needed. That is correct. We, we have them come with us anytime we feel it's necessary. And they're, they're a great assistance. Absolutely, very good. Um, Council Member Jawando, are you walking hey, away? There he yes, is. Yes, I'm here, yeah. I, I was gonna say, I can wait until um, we do the legal aid update. The, the, most of my questions are related, are related okay. to that. Uh, well, without anyone else commenting on this, I guess we will now turn to the legal aid update. So, Captain Lewis, thank you very much, and uh, please do keep us posted as as we are all uh, waiting to see what happens with the emergency order that uh, that the governor uh, will might rescind at at any point in time or will expire, and how that uh, affects our workload and our our residents here, who, as Chair Abernaz just said, whose dignity. Uh, we want to maintain as much as possible and help them through this process. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McMillan. Um, yes, so Frank Vitale, who uh, is with the Montgomery County Legal Aid Office, is here to talk to you about his observations. I did just want to mention one thing in relation to Captain Lewis's data. Um, you recently had a state legislative discussion, one of the pieces of proposed state legislation uh, offered up by the Office of the Attorney General would increase the filing fee and in part, that is because Maryland has a very low filing fee. So one of the reasons you have a lot of filings is it's very easy to file. So um, sometimes landlords file multiple times um, and Mr. Vital can tell you more than that, but I did just wanna mentioned that you know in in the area of evictions there is some state legislation that is pending um, that could also help in in the eviction process and with that i'd turn it over to mr vital sure good afternoon everyone and uh thank you for inviting me to speak today about what we're seeing in courts um my name is frank vitale i'm the supervising attorney for uh, the Montgomery County Office of Maryland Legal Aid. Um, I am the senior most housing attorney and uh, 
I work with my colleagues across the state to uh, advocate for a, a right to safe and secure housing. Um, right now, obviously, our priority is eviction defense. Um, so uh, Captain Lewis uh, spoke pretty comprehensively about a, a lot of what we're seeing, so I won't retread too much of the background, uh, but I did want to give everyone just sort of a, a perhaps another understanding of exactly what we're seeing right now, how that has changed, and what we might expect to see in the coming months. So there are moratoriums in effect. Um, the CDC moratorium is the one that most people think of, although Governor Hogan's order did provide uh, an additional layer of protection for tenants. Um, the CDC order, uh, I believe Captain Lewis touched on this briefly, does not touch most types of eviction cases. I would say uh, in terms of pure numbers, it does um, affect most of them as long as the tenant raises the protection. Uh, an affidavit has to be given to the landlord. Some judges um, have required tenants to demonstrate that what they're saying is true and the affidavit actually is true. Um, some are not, uh, and, and that's a, a pretty common theme that we're seeing is there is inconsistency even within one courthouse. Uh, forget statewide and with the CDC, obviously, it's nationwide, so there's, there's all kinds of inconsistencies. Um, so as of right now, we are in phase two of five. We were up to phase four in October, and then we moved back to phase three around Thanksgiving, and then I got back from Thanksgiving, and it was back to phase two, which is where we're at now. The plan uh, that we've been told um, is that phase two will continue through March 14th. Um, that may change depending on uh, the, the numbers that, that we're seeing, uh, I think both immunization numbers as well as, um, I'm sorry, vaccination numbers as well as infection numbers. Um, it may be that this is extended out and it may be that it's not. Something to keep in mind about these phases though is they're not intended to protect any party. They are not tenant protections. The fact that phase two means that there's no failure to pay rent cases going forward is not a gift to tenants. Um, it is intended to reduce traffic in the courthouse, uh, which obviously is intended to reduce um, infection rates. Uh, in normal times, the failure to pay rent docket, which is its own docket, uh, as opposed to the sort of more general landlord tenant docket, which covers the other types of cases Captain Lewis talked about, the failure to pay rent docket has hundreds of people there. Um, you know, the courtrooms are packed and then the hallways are packed. And so obviously right now um, the court recognizes that that's not really feasible. Um, so the phases are really what are keeping these numbers down. Uh, moratoriums are certainly helpful. The CDC order has been helpful for, for our clients and for other tenants, um, but it is not the, uh, the, the you know, wonderful shield that some people think that it might be. Um, the protection, again, right now, is just the mere fact that there's not really any way to do this safely for failure to pay cases. That said, uh, there are still landlord tenant cases going forward. Phase two permits um, emergency breach of lease actions, uh, rent escrow actions, which are sort of their, their own separate thing, uh, emergency wrongful detainer actions, and emergency tenant holding over actions. There's not a lot of guidance as to what the term emergency means with the exception of a breach of lease cases. Um, in those, it involves a threat, a threat or injury to people or property. Um, which is sort of something that's developed. Uh, there's you know, a developed understanding of what an emergency breach of lease any, is anyways for uh, the purposes of notice. Wrongful detainer actions or forcible entry and detainer actions as they're also called are going forward. We, we've seen a number of emergency tenant holding over actions. Um, it is my opinion and the opinion of legal aid that uh, the conception of an emergency tenant holding over is a little labored. Um, I don't, you know, the, the point of an tenant holding over action is that the lease is over. I don't believe that that can ever be an emergency. If a landlord believes that there is an emergency, there are other causes of action that they can raise, but those causes of action do have a higher burden of proof. Um, so we are seeing these cases go forward. Um, I would say on average, uh, 14 to 16 cases a week. Uh, they're being held on Wednesdays. We are present 
uh, at the beginning of 2020, we had started a program where we went in with volunteers and sort of provided day of representation to those who qualify, um, either through us or through the Bar Foundation or through a partner, um, depending on eligibility issues. Uh, obviously, as the court started to shut down and then reopen, we had to sort of shift our priorities and shift our resources around, but we are still going in. Uh, so we are seeing, like I said, 14 to 16. At this point, the majority of them are breach of lease cases. There are a handful of tenant holding over cases and uh, actually a surprising number of rent escrow matters as well. Um, rent escrow doesn't have as much to do with evictions now. Uh, they can be raised defensively in failure pay rent cases, but since those aren't going forward, I won't spend too much time on that. I understand that, um, you know, the focus today is on evictions and preventing homelessness. So as of right now, we are still seeing these cases go forward. Our ability to assist is, um, is limited by a number of factors. Uh, Captain Lewis talked about this. Attendance. Attendance is a huge problem. Attendance has always been a huge problem. Um, you, you can go in and there will be one lawyer will go in for the plaintiff and he will have 20, 30, 50 cases. And of those 20, 30, 50 cases, maybe 10 families will, will attend. And some of those other ones will be dismissed. And then the majority of those other ones will be uncontested. Um, and, and won't be able to go forward. In normal times, this is, obviously a problem. Um, it's even more of a problem now. Uh, many tenants believe that the CDC order or one other order or another completely prevents all evictions from going forward, which obviously it doesn't. I mean, again, the bar right now is, is just a matter of case numbers being down, not necessarily the moratoriums being in place. So attendance is an issue. Um, many tenants, um, unfortunately, are in a position where even with aid from the county uh, or you know a nonprofit or a church or something or friendly, family and friends, the rent owed is too high to make up. We are seeing cases where you know the county can give four thousand here, maybe they get two thousand from friends and family, but they owe ten thousand, fifteen thousand. It's been almost a year now since this has has really sort of escalated to the level that it's at. So. A lot of tenants just, you know, they they want to wait it out. They know that there's no failure to pay rent that are going forward right now. And um, I understand why some of them say to themselves, I would rather take this money and use it to to relocate. It's just an economic decision. So um, those are some challenges that we're seeing. Access to courts has been a problem, although not on a, a major, um, it, it, it's been a problem that sort of the, the community is working through. The majority of cases being heard now are being heard over Zoom. Um, and while that does work for many people, our office included, it doesn't work for all tenants. Um, many of our tenants, briefly, legal aid serves um, low income tenants. We have financial requirements and you know you have to make under a certain amount of money to qualify and that's how it works for most organizations like ours throughout the country. And many of our clients either do not have uh, the device that they need at home. They don't have access. Normally they would go to a library for this kind of thing, but obviously that's less than ideal for our court process and most of those are closed now anyways. Um, access to courts is an issue. Access technology is an issue. We also see this as a problem with um, some of our older clients who uh, may not may not feel comfortable doing it virtually or may not understand how, how to get through that. Um, let's see. Uh, client awareness and tenant awareness of the current situation is a problem. We, we've been doing our best and so have other, plenty of other organizations, uh, CASA, HPRP, Renters Alliance, uh, to, to do outreach to make sure that tenants know what they have available to them. And uh, th those are the biggest issues. And then finally, uncertainty. Um, so I've been asked multiple times by multiple parties and uh you know what where do you see this going like what do you think is going to happen and i've stopped trying to make predictions at this point we've been told that you know the move to phase three uh would involve opening up all cases except for failure to pay rent so it would be a, a higher number of breach cases and ten holding over cases and then phase four would represent opening it up to failure to pay rents which is really where we're expecting the the cliff um but I expected the cliff in September, 
and uh, it, most of those cases were so old that they were either dismissed because somebody had paid off the months that had been filed for, or there were a lot of cases that very, you know, that very few people actually showed. So we've been told, um, and this was as of a couple of weeks ago, that there were 14,000 failure to pay rent cases uh, backed up, 14,000, which uh, is, I believe that back in September, they were looking at eight. So there, it's a higher number. Um, we have heard a number of different rumors on how this is going to go forward. I think that the court is still trying to figure it out. Um, it's a difficult, it's a difficult problem and uh, everyone has an opinion on how it should be solved. So uh, we're looking at anywhere between, you know, a return to the normal thing where you've got one or two, maybe three dockets or three days a week with two or three dockets a day, uh, all the way up to, you know, five dockets a day, two courtrooms, five days a week. Uh, so I don't really know what to expect. Um, I know that it's going to be difficult. I know that unfortunately, um, the moratoriums that are, are in place are not going to be enough to protect many tenants. Um, and uh, while I am certainly sympathetic to the plight of, of certain landlords, um, you know, our priority is to, is to keep as many people as housed as possible. Um, a secondary priority of ours and a secondary concern is um, obviously we, we want to do what we can to prevent evictions, but some evictions cannot be prevented. Some evictions are going to happen. Um, and housing stabilization, getting somebody relocated to a new spot and minimizing the effect that these uh, that these have on families and children in particular is is a huge concern for us. Um, right, and, and and Mr. Vitale, if 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 I could jump in, um, I mm -hmm. know some colleagues have questions, and and the forecast you 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 just shared, uh, you know, is an uncertain one, and that's what we're all bracing for. And I know that uh, legal aid, and and also I've been in contact with the homeless persons representation project, mm -hmm. uh, and so both of you uh, as organizations are, are preparing for what could be a lot of cases. And you just shared the, the 14,000 number backlog. Um, and those numbers, uh, those cases could be coming, you know, in quick succession whenever the moratoria is lifted and the courts fully resume their work. And so uh, we know that this is gonna be a big undertaking, a tragic one, quite frankly. And so uh, I'm curious, and I know we're all curious about uh, any additional support that, that you think you and, and more importantly, the residents might need because we're talking about the same people who have been hit the hardest due to the economic realities of this pandemic. And it, it seems that uh, legal aid is getting some funding, I think, through the state um, to, to help some of the lowest income renters, uh, but certainly we wanna help as many people as we can. So uh, can you share what kind of support you're, you're getting either from the state or, or other uh, or here and, and what, what do you think you might need? Certainly. So we are, um, I mean, broadly speaking, we receive most of our funding from uh, filing fees and IOLTA accounts, interest and lawyer trust accounts. Uh, and then we get some LSC funding, which does come with some strings, which I'll very briefly talk about in a second. Uh, we are receiving some assistance from the county already, which has been really great. It's allowed us to do this program in court. Um, obviously, uh, and I, I can't speak to what, other organizations may be receiving. Um, I will say that one of the strings that we have as an LLC funded organization is we cannot help anyone who is not documented, except in very, very limited circumstances, which generally do not come up in housing cases. Sometimes they will, but not usually. Um, so, uh, I, you know, we've had a, a wonderful experience working with HBRP um, and, uh, you know, I, they are able to do some stuff that we can't. They're a much smaller organization, but they are help, able to help us fill the gaps. Um, you know, right now we've been we've been preparing for court and what happens when the courts open, and that's what we have to do because we're a law firm first. But uh, we could, I mean, all organizations could use additional assistance in this. Um, you know, I, I there's a lot of opportunities to partner with other organizations to cover our gaps. Um, there's uh, a, a big need for sort of what happens afterwards, assistance on what happens afterwards. Captain Lewis talked about this, you know, sort of alluded to this issue uh, where, you know, what happens after an eviction happens? They, they call a social worker and who can come help. 
Sometimes you want that assistance before a court to help somebody relocate or apply for these funds. Many of our clients struggle with mental health issues and can't navigate this process on their own. Uh, I think that there's a, a real need for, and certainly a real opportunity to do additional outreach, um, additional know your right situations. We have a really developed um, program in Baltimore that does this. Um, obviously, their, their outreach looks different now than it did a year and a half ago, but um, you know, I've been in contact with, with them to sort of pick their brain on what they think more we could be doing, how are they changed, uh, what can we do too. Um, and then, you know, I, I think that this is, this is not, obviously we're focusing on evictions, but this is something that affects families all the way down, um, you know, and it's, it goes the other way too. We, we have a big family law practice here. Contested custody is a major issue in Montgomery County. Um, and there are a lot of instances where the income disparity is really great between one spouse and another. So you'll see instances where that leads to the risk of homelessness for one spouse and for the children. Um, we see a, a loss of income or reduction in benefits, unemployment denials, SSI reductions, leading to homelessness. Uh, we represent a lot of children in the foster care system. Um, so, you know, expanding our look to our, expanding our program, which we already serve these needs, we'd like to do it more, uh, to sort of recognize that one legal issue is not just one legal issue. Um, we have a human rights framework at Maryland Legal Aid. We treat everything as affecting all the rights that somebody has because it does. Um, so there's always more we could be doing. Um, I, you know, I can't get too far into the specifics now, but rest assured, I've had this conversation uh, with my colleagues and uh, with my spouse and with my dog and with my family. I've talked about it over and over again to try and figure out what more we can do. So, um, well, I, I have found that dogs are sometimes my best listeners as well. Um, so uh, yeah. we're in good company there. Uh, but but to the point that uh, Chair Albernaz had made before in the conversation with Captain Lewis, uh, you know, if there are best practices or other practices that are happening in Baltimore City, Baltimore County uh, mm -hmm. that are worth looking at here, I, I would like to take a look at that so that sure. we can continue this conversation, sans dogs. Um, but uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Council Member Jawando, who I know has some, uh, would like to speak. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lead uh, Glass. Can You guys can hear me okay? Is, can you? Okay, awesome. Um, and appreciate all the work you're doing, Mr. Vitale. I know it's a, it's a difficult, you're literally, you know, doing God's work. So uh, appreciate the work you're doing, especially right now. So you mentioned a couple questions. You mentioned outreach. Um, you know, I had that circled on my chart, on my notes here whether it's a multiple program or something else, that seems to be like we can't, there's no, there's not enough outreach we could do because, you know, just I'm a county council member and I bet you if we polled, I won't put my colleagues on the spot, but I bet you if you asked most people who are in the know, what is the moratorium, the various moratoriums that are in place provide as far as protection, you'd get six, seven, eight different answers and they would lean towards it provides more protection than it probably does, um, both in the short term and the long term. And we've learned more today about these types of cases. So the outreach, not only to know what is actually covered, but also that at some point this is going to end and you're going to need the help. So could you talk to me about the, you know, the, the, the form of that outreach, at, you know, just briefly how, what it might look like, what it costs, what do you think is, because I think, you know, we, we have to do more. But is, that would be something I'd be, I think all of us would be curious in. So I can't, I mean, I can't speak too much to what it costs. Uh, that's, uh, that's somebody else's purview. I, I do the work. What's, and in, they, what's they entailed? Tell me how much what's it entailed? Is. But um, we, you know, we've done, we've done all kinds of things. We've done, again, pre-COVID, we were doing a lot of lawyer and library type stuff. We would go and we'd set up and we'd talk to people. We've uh, visited larger buildings um, and done explanations there. We worked with uh, the city of Tacoma Park actually uh, has, has had us come in and talk to their tenants uh, in some of their bigger buildings a couple times. Um, we have done public facing webinars on a handful of occasions. We have a, a regular sort of rotating presentation, I believe on our Facebook page. Um, so, you know, an expansion of all that, 
one any, of the any issues, geo targeting, like any kind of like a direct advertise, you know, kind of looking at where people are, where you have high eviction rates and getting on people's phones in that way. Any, is um, it, have you heard any of that? Not as much in this county. Uh, we, we, you know, there's, there's limitations on what we can do that, you know, if it touches on direct solicitation, that's, that's, you know, we really shouldn't be doing that. We treat it generally more as a know your rights kind of thing. Uh -huh. And we rely on our partner organizations to, you know, uh, to talk to who they may be getting calls from. You know, if CASA gets a call from somebody and they know that it's a legal issue that they may be able to help on, you know, they have their own staff that does that kind of work. But, I, you know, I, I tell them, please call me whenever you have a problem. Matt Losak has my number on speed dial whenever he is a tenant with an issue. So um, we work a lot with partner organizations to do outreach. Um, uh, one of the issues right now, again, and I alluded to this before with access to courts, is there's this understanding or this belief by by many people who who mean well that we can just do all of this via Zoom. But there are thousands of people right now who are not watching this, um, who can't watch this, either because they don't have internet access or they are, you know, working the part-time job that they were able to keep. So right. There's there's real value, and that's the program that was working so well in Baltimore, and I imagine will be working again. Is we went to these places to say, if you have a problem, you come talk to us. That's more difficult now, and and trying to find a way to reach everyone, and not just the people who have internet access and are are free at you know two o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. Um, we want to make sure that we can get to everyone. Okay, so we'll, 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 it sounds like we have some follow up to do with you and our the other partners to try to design some sort of outreach program that I mean, I, cause I just, I think all of us would want to support that. Uh, the breach of lease, um, you mentioned, so 14,000 that are on the waiting list, you know, cases backed up for failure to pay rent. That's 14,000 that have been filed in court that are on the ready to be heard, right? Yes, that is my understanding. And then br the breaches of lease, which are allowed now, you said failure to pay rent is is not part of that. Or is can you explain the relationship between what can move forward now, and so what do you normally see as far as the breach of lease, and how many of those are you seeing between those fourteen to sixteen a week? I think you said fourteen to sixteen of you know eviction cases a week. I think you said. Yeah, it's been shifting. Um, I, I will say that you know we've been seeing it, at the beginning we were seeing an awful lot of ten holding over actions. And I think that, so again, this is my interpretation, and I'm sure that there are, are individuals out there who feel differently, but I, there, I, there was the understanding or the belief that the 10 holding over actions were being abused, um, ways to get around the, the bar on FTPRs. Um, but now we are seeing primarily breach of lease cases when it comes to evictions. Um, I, the last docket we had yesterday, I think there were 15 cases Two of them or three of them were rent escrow cases. One was a tenant only over. One was a forced land entry detainer and the remaining 10 were breach of lease cases. So, um, and what are those breach, breach of lease for what? What are they, what are they, give me an example of one. I know they're all different, but so, what can you be um, evicted for right now for breach of lease? Uh, anything the court finds to be an emergency that constitutes a threat to life, health, or property. Uh, so, and there's no case law on that. It's pretty subjective. Is is there is there a trend emerging? There there is some there is some guidance on it. Uh, so really briefly speaking, a breach of lease uh, requires a 30 day notice, except when it only requires 14 days notice. And for it to require 14 days notice, it has to be it has to basically be an emergency. So we're able to make an argument to say, you know, there's there's some guidance on this for what an emergency breach of lease is, and and. My understanding is that the judges um, make this determination before it's scheduled. The idea is if something is filed and, you know, you're being, you breach of lease is because you, you know, were smoking in the unit and you're not anymore. That's not an emergency and the judges can schedule it. Um, we're seeing a lot of incidents where it's um, conflicts, um, conflicts with neighbors, conflicts with property managers, um, a handful of occasions where it's overcrowding uh, and, um, those are the big ones. That's normally what we see in these emergency cases. Overcrowding. So people that are needing to find housing being in there, multiple people in the unit. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the 14,000, again, is just failure to pay rent cases. Failure to pay rent. It's not right. not the other else. things. So. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate it. I mean, I think, you know, I know we have limited authority here at the 
local level related to ev evictions, but the idea that we would be uh, putting people out on the street because they have either lost a job or needing to crap, be housed in a place with multiple people, uh, that seems to fly in the face of the CDC order, the go governor's order. It, it just it, it doesn't seem to make any sense at all that we would do that for not only moral reasons, but health reasons. So, um, you know, keep in touch with us. Uh, you know, we'll certainly work with our state delegation and I'm glad the filing fee bill is out there, but, you know, I, we're going to need a serious mor moratorium and period of forgiveness, I think, after this pandemic to allow people even a chance to make alternative arrangements. But would you agree with that statement? I would. Um, you know, the, the tail end of this crisis is going to take an awful long time to resolve. Uh, as I said, an eviction is a major disruption in the life of a family. Um, and, and we're not even talking about, you know, if somebody's evicted from subsidized housing, they lose their subsidy, they're not going to be able to afford to live anywhere in Montgomery County or really anywhere in the state. Um, you know, we're looking at that. We're looking at kids being taken out of schools partway through or you know, away from schools, I guess, at this point is more accurate. Um, yeah, I would agree. It's going to take a long time to resolve. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Um, I, I appreciate your, your thoughts and questions and, and, you know, I, I might have jumped the gun in, in asking my previous question to Captain Lewis about the, the allowances for emergency evictions, the breach of lease, the tenant holdover, the forcible entry detainer, because as Councilmember Jawando just shared, uh, it seems like there really is not uh, an eviction moratorium or much of it here in, in the county or in the state. I, so, I would also just to highlight, and I, I apologize for interrupting, there is one other thing I wanted to mention about the current phases. There is a provision, and this is in, um, it's in one of the administrative orders. Uh, the most recent one is from February 2nd. There is a provision that allows the court to go forward with any case that it feels it needs to for the administration of justice. So there is some wiggle room. There is some leeway. I've seen one failure to pay rent since September, um, and it was in relation to another case. So um, we're not seeing it that much in Montgomery County, uh, thankfully, but we are getting reports of other counties' benches, other counties' courts, allowing them to like, just deciding, okay, you know, we can do this one over Zoom, so we're going to go forward with it. Um, so even within these phases, there is wiggle room. So Sure. Well, thank you for that additional information. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Council Member Rice. Yeah, so thank you very much for addressing that, because as the Council's representative for the Maryland Association of Counties, this is something that's a statewide issue. Uh, something that many jurisdictions across the state are incredibly concerned about. And so from that perspective, to Councilmember Jawando's point, to your point, Councilmember Glass, uh, it really is one in which um, there truly isn't a moratorium on uh, evictions. Folks have decided in good graces that they're most likely not going to move forward for the most part. Uh, and we see that, however, We've seen evictions here in Montgomery County. I've, I've, I've seen them. Uh, and so uh, from that perspective, you know, we had one that was in Clarksburg uh, <laughs> that my staff had to deal with. It was in my district. Uh, so again, these are instances and times in which we will need what I think uh, is some sort of statewide commitment as there is that quasi uh, county state judicial system that continues to exist that really would solidify what it is that we're going to be doing and how we're going to be moving forward. Uh, and without that, it makes it so much harder for us to operate uh, within uh, and really to protect some of those most vulnerable. Now, at the same time, you'll hear arguments from uh, those who represent landlords as well as landlords themselves, that they too have fiscal uh, responsibilities. That is true as well, but there needs to be a comprehensive solution that addresses all of those understanding that at a time in which we have a global pandemic is not a time to put people on the streets and put more people at risk. Um, that is not wise, uh, nor is it the uh, uh, most uh, appropriate thing to do uh, in the midst of a health pandemic. So with that, um, just know that we are having this conversation at the state level as well, uh, trying to ask for a state comprehensive solution. And so we continue to hope that the governor 
uh, and our legislators will be responsive in that end. So. Thank you. These are not normal times. Absolutely not. And so uh, keep us all posted on, on those NACO conversations, our NACO rep. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I don't see any other comments or, or, or uh, requests to speak. So, uh, Mr. Vitale, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, do stay in touch again uh, as we know this pipeline continues to grow. Uh, and once the state of emergency ends, uh, we, we'll, we'll see what kind of support we need to, to put into our court system and, and keep people housed. Uh, which is the topic of the next conversation, making sure people who are currently in housing uh, can stay in housing. So we'll we'll follow up with you as, as the situation progresses. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. So Ms. McMillan, uh, I think there's a DHCA and Amanda Ms. Harris. Har yeah, Amanda Harris has um, a brief presentation to get you updated on rental assistance. Good afternoon, uh, Amanda Harris, Chief of Services to End and Prevent Homelessness. I do have a very brief presentation, uh, just giving you a status update on the COVID rent relief program, and then a brief overview of the $31.4 million from the Department of Treasury for the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. I do have a slide deck, if that could be brought up. I think you have access to share your screen, Amanda. Oh, okay. Give me one moment. Ms. Harris, I can also bring it up for you. If you, if you prefer, Ms. Harris, I can also bring it up for you. I have it ready. That would be great. I did not, I don't have it ready. <laughs> Thank you. You could just go ahead and skip to the next slide. So here is where we are at as of Monday for the COVID rent relief program. We have issued 61% of the funds. Uh, that's a little over $12 million. Um, over 3,000 households have already been served. Um, a little more than half of the checks issued have come from our high high need area. So as a reminder, we did create a homeless prevention index, uh, trying to identify particular census tracts that um, had households that were most likely to experience homelessness or, or eviction. Um, other things to highlight here, we have seen a significant amount of new clients. So folks that have not accessed HHS services before 17% of the checks issued are coming from folks that are brand new to, to uh, health and human services. So I think that speaks to our outreach efforts and trying to reach communities that uh, have been maybe reluctant to accept help or were not aware that uh, assistance was available to them. You can go to the next slide, please. A little more information about the applicants, you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, over 9,000 applications were received. Um, we have, as I said, we've issued payments for over 3,000. Uh, we have conditional approvals out for a little less than 400 now, and about 1,200 are currently being processed. So we are nearing the end. We're getting very close uh, to uh, reaching the 5,000 households. Uh, you can see that the average rent was around 1,400. The average amount owed was 3,300. I should note that this amount owed was at the time of application. So it is taking us a while to actually process these applications. And so what we're seeing by the time um, we actually are able to reach the household, that arrears, has gone up significantly. Uh, as previously mentioned, um, we are seeing some folks with arrears in as much as $10,000, $12,000, which our $4,000 uh, assistance is not going to, it's not gonna help. Um, 
So that's just something that we need to think about as we think about the future. 67% uh, are female, average age is 40. Uh, we know that single parent households are more likely to get evicted. So we're quite pleased to see that uh, we're reaching that population. Uh, you can see the, the race and ethnicity breakdown. So uh, about 90% of the folks that we're serving are people of color, which is great uh, since they are more at risk of homelessness and eviction. Next slide, please. Just a little more details about uh, the demographics of the population we're serving. So we're looking at those in the high need areas and then outside of the high need areas. There isn't a lot of difference between the two groups, but we do see that in the high need areas, they have slightly more children. Uh, their rents are a little bit lower. Um, and their income is, is a little bit lower as well. Um, you can see the, the racial breakdown, it's about even between the high need and the, and the other areas. Uh, and then uh, we also are looking at the monthly income. So 42% of the households that applied uh, were reporting a monthly income of less than $1,000. So this uh, speaks to the need to provide longer term assistance. Uh, $1,000, if the average rent is 1600 for a two bedroom apartment, that's not gonna get you there even with our assistance. So we have to think about how do we, how do we provide uh, longer term assistance for people? Uh, I will also note that uh, these, even at the highest end uh, with folks reporting $3,000 of income, that's still extremely low. Uh, that's still, that's below 40% um, AMI and uh, most, folks are falling uh, at 30% AMI or below. Next slide, please. So this map shows uh, all of our high need areas and the ones in red are where we did not get as many applicants as we expected to get. Uh, so on average, 23% uh, of renters with incomes below $50,000 are, are um, in the high the high need census areas. And these ones in red, we only had applications from about 15% of renters. So we weren't getting the kind of penetration that we had hoped for. So as we expand the program and we get more resources, we wanna make sure that we do that specific outreach to these areas so that we are in fact reaching people. And that will involve working with our nonprofit and community partners to ensure that we're getting the word out. And I think Mr. Vettel spoke about the need to do more outreach. And I think that will be part of our strategy as well. How are we reaching folks and making sure they know what's available to them? Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears for a little bit and talk about the new uh, Department of Treasury program. Uh, we are still, I will just say up front that we are still awaiting more details on what exactly the parameters of this program are. The Treasury Department had issued uh, an FAQ um, back in, I think, the beginning of January that has since been retracted and they have not posted a new FAQ. So we are hoping that the new FAQ will allow some more flexibility, uh, allowing for self-certification, uh, maybe provide some more clarity on um, what the what the eligibility criteria is. One thing that is in the the bill language is that you it allows you to pay prospective rent. So we can not we can pay arrears and we can also provide future rent. So we could pay for an additional six months or nine months. But there is a stipulation that you must pay off at least some amount of the arrears in order to pay prospective rent. So we are hoping to get some clarity on what exactly that means. Um, for some households, they do want to make the financial decision that it would be better for them to find a new, more affordable place rather than paying $20,000 in arrears and getting maybe two months of future assistance. That it might be better if we could cut a deal with the landlord close out that that lease and find a place that's more affordable and pay future rent for them. So uh, hoping to get more clarity, but you can see the, the criteria um, 
that basically it's a COVID related income loss. They're at risk of homelessness or housing instability and a household income of 80% AMI or below or the general eligibility criteria. Treasury is asking all communities to prioritize households that are unemployed for more than 90 days at the time of application and households that are at or below 50% AMI. Next slide, please. So here is what we're thinking, uh, the, the core program components of our local imp implementation of the emergency rental assistance program. So the ERAP does allow you to spend up to 10% on administration and housing stability services. Uh, we will be spending some of that money on admin as we want to be able to process much faster. And so we do need to hire staff and we're looking at investing in a, a better online application system, but there is room to provide some housing stability services. So that is, we're working with DHCA and our other partners to figure out exactly what that looks like, but that could include case management, housing counseling, legal aid, some of that, that outreach work uh, and, and tenant education uh, that we talked about earlier. And then the other big component is a continuation of the COVID rent relief program. So as designed, this would be a standard benefit amount uh, that can be used for both arrears and some portion of future rent. Uh, the, COVID rent relief right now is 4,000. We hope to increase that given this has been going on for quite some time and people have more arrears than what they had before. Uh, the next component, which we're excited about is the extended rental assistance. So this would be for households that have very, extremely low income uh, and very high arrears and need they need uh, additional assistance. So the Regulations allow you to provide up to 12 months of, of assistance with an option if they still are can certify their income and are income eligible for another three months. So really it's a maximum of, of 15 months of assistance. Important to note though that that is that 15 months includes both the arrears that you're paying and future rent. So it's it's not as much as we would like it to be, but it's it's definitely uh, going to be of great assistance to those households that really have no income and no ability to pay. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, limited utility assistance. So this would be for households that don't have any income or very limited ability to pay their, their utilities. We have an existing utility assistance program uh, funded by the state, the Office of Home Energy Program, and then we also have some local funding already available to assist people with, with their utilities. And what we have found is that the utility companies are much more willing to negotiate with people and to set up a payment plan as opposed to the landlord. So we think that it would be a better use of these resources to spend it primarily on, on rent relief. I think that is all I have. So I will stop and see if there are any questions. Uh, thank you for uh, that deep dive on, on everything that we've been doing. Um, before we move forward, um, I, I think it would actually be advantageous to the fuller conversation if you were to talk about the $31 million that we're going to get uh, so that we can have a full conversation about all the relief that, we're, that, we're, that we've received and that we're going to receive. Are you prepared to do that, Ms. Harris? Yeah, so that last section that I was just talking about, that is the 31.4 million. Right, okay, about those are the, the yeah, those are, Yep, those are the core components. It, I, I don't have all the details yet because we're still waiting for clarity. Excellent, excellent. Um, so uh, regarding the deep dive, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I've uh, shared with, with my colleagues uh, some of the information regarding the point in time count. I don't know if there's anything that you can share with us publicly uh, to, to share about what what you and your team and, and uh, everybody else who went out saw on that, that cold night a few weeks ago. Sure, I can share a little bit. Uh, I don't I don't have good uh, data yet. Uh, I have I, I do have a sense of our unsheltered count, so that's what you and, and others have participated in, where we go out and, and um, identify people that are sleeping outside. So our unsheltered count definitely was down um, from previous years, so that's good. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that that is because we have invested in hotels, in additional shelter. Uh, we have been housing people. We have actually been housing people at uh, double the rate that we did in 2019. So we are 
we are housing folks. We are getting them, getting them out of shelter. Uh, I can also say that our family numbers, I think I've reported this before, are, are much lower than normal. Uh, we have decreased our family homelessness by about 72%, uh, the lowest numbers that we have. So I, I feel like this investment in eviction prevention and homeless prevention is certainly having an impact on families and families are being stabilized in their, in their home. What it is not having as much of an impact on is those single adults uh, that are typically, you know, they're couch surfing, they're staying with friends and relatives, but as that family feels the financial pressure and strain, they're far less likely to allow that person to stay. So we continue to see um, a rise in the number of people seeking shelter. We have these extra resources that we're trying to get them uh, into housing, but it's, we're just we're just maintaining at this point. We're not actually working to re to reduce. Well, well, your your on the ground counts showing that that there were fewer people on the street or out in the natural environment this year versus last year, uh, and that is a trend that has continued. Is uh, I, I think uh, an incredible testament to county government to to this council to members of the previous councils, right? Because this has been built up. Um, and the infrastructure and the investment, as you correctly said, over the last uh, number of years, at least a decade, if not more. Uh, and so uh, uh, there is a lot of credit that, that goes around for something like this. And the mere fact that there are fewer people on the street during a pandemic um, is an incredible testament to our values here in Montgomery County uh, and putting, putting resources into the, these efforts. So um, please commend your team. Uh, and, and all the providers who, who help with this incredible work. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to the chair of the Fed Committee. Thank you. I apologize. I had to step away for a minute. I, it has been a lot of uh, frantic calls about the vaccinations today. I'm sure everyone is getting similar outreach. Um, and I just felt like I had to take a call. Um, I, I came back in when you were describing um, the geographic uh, prioritization of the rental assistance. Um, and I'm just a little unclear, are we fully able to expend the funding or is it going more slowly than it could? Um, I, I sort of recall, but I would ask my colleagues what their recollection is, is that we met envisioned that we were going to be overwhelmed by applications. And so we felt that we should put in geographic restriction uh, in addition to income restriction. And of course, there's income restriction. Um, however, we have not been overwhelmed. And so I wonder, does it make sense to, do we need to look at lifting the geographic reception, restrict, restriction, recognizing that there are low-income people, you know, everywhere in the county, more or less, not everywhere, but you know what I mean. Um, so can you just talk a bit about that and what you recommend? Sure. So the geographic location is not actually an eligibility criteria. It is simply how we prioritize. So okay. when we started this initiative, we did, we were processing first the applications that came from those high need, um, those high need census tracts. And then we did that for about 30 days and then we opened it up uh, to the, the entire county, which is how we've been operating. So on the map, what I showed was just those areas that we would have expected more people to apply, but they didn't. So we weren't actually reaching um, those hardest hit. But we, and the plan, our hope for the, the new money is to do a similar thing, that it would not be where you live is not an eligibility criteria because you're absolutely right. There are low income people throughout, um, but just that helps us to to really focus on where do we need to do that specific outreach and okay. who is best suited to do that. And it's probably it's not HHS. Right? It's an outreach uh, guide. Correct. Uh, yes. More than, okay, that's very helpful. Correct. Um, and then how are you, how does this, how does the rental assistance mesh with eviction prevention? I mean, I've heard that you have a crisis unit that joins, uh, you know, legal aid at the courts and so forth. But do you think that the, the, the next uh, round of aid, you know, are, are, have you been able to uh, help address the eviction issue and, and 
can you do more of that with the next round of aid so that, you know, are people able to have their arrears resolved, you know, and, and at least up until that moment in time, have the, have their uh, record, you know, their, their debt, you know, eliminated so that they can go forward without falling right back into the hole. Mm -hmm. So the way it's working right now is anyone that is actually facing eviction, so not just behind in rent, but they have um, a writ or a, a red and white, we are pulling those and we are processing those right away because those can't wait. Uh, it is taking a, a while to process the, the regular COVID. You said you match, you match the, the writs against the applications and you process them right away. Is that what you mean? If we know that they have one, if they yeah. are, if they call 311, if we're okay. alerted, then, then we'll pull them. I think, and this has always been a problem and I don't, I don't have an easy solution is that people, sometimes people just don't do anything, don't ask for assistance until it is too late. And I think that has a lot to do with just stress and anxiety and not having the kind of the bandwidth to be able to deal with it. So they just kind of push it to a side until they, they can't anymore. And so in those situations, we, we do what we can to assist, but there, not every eviction can be stopped. If someone owes $20,000, we can't help, but what we can do is come in and help get storage, help relocate, make sure that they have a safe place to stay that, you know, that they're not sleeping outside. Um, but that that's rare. Uh, most of the time we are able to reach people before that happens. And we have a very good communication with the sheriff's office and that relationship has been working well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Good questions, and and you know I'll, I'll follow up by saying that uh, I was uh, relieved to hear that you're going to be spending, uh, anticipate spending some of the 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 new revenue, uh, the, the new money on uh, on administration and administrative hires, uh, because to to Chair Reamer's point, uh, I had a constituent who contacted me um, uh, very late in his process uh, and was very concerned, and then had a wait list or at least wasn't, wasn't being responded to in the manner in which someone who is in crisis hopes to be responded to. Uh, and that's a volume problem and uh, an administrative issue. And so to bring more people on to help work through those caseloads, uh, I, I think will be very welcome moving forward. So Great. good decision. Yep. Yeah, uh, and we're hopeful that uh, with the, the, the new online application, hoping, this is not set in stone, that people will actually be able to check their status. Because uh, I think just knowing that someone is aware that it, that they're working on it will help relieve some of that uh, that anxiety. Um, there is a lot of work on websites and, and government agencies and departments across the board that we can fix. Uh, yeah. And so the fact that you are taking the reins, uh, trying to improve our website for this one program uh, is very welcome news. Uh, and for anyone else who's listening who can fix websites, particularly in Annapolis, um, please do that. Um, uh, HHS Chair, Mr. Albernas. Um, thank you, Councilmember Glass. Um, just a point of privilege, Ms. Harris, we have been referring a number of different constituent cases to your office over the last several months, and I just want to thank you and your team. Um, I've been immensely impressed with how you've handled all of them uh, and just really want to express my appreciation to all of you for your, your very hard work. And uh, we call you day and night, literally, and you always pick up the phone. So um, you, you are doing a great job. I appreciate you. A um, cu couple of uh, questions. So the, the last time we received a briefing on the rental assistance program, and clearly we've made great strides, um, really appreciate all the efforts. I know it's a complex issue. At the time, uh, three, two couple things caught my attention. Um, one is, you know, there, there was a significant percentage, particularly of 311 calls regarding um, uh, requesting rental assistance that were Spanish speakers, uh, which is evidence that the outreach is working um, because we've had several town halls and I know we've been very aggressive and working with our community stakeholders and media partners. That's the good news. Um, but I also know that there are still a lot of folks that are out there because of the concern of the possibility or the impression that this may impact their public charge uh, and thus preventing them from maybe accessing some of the 
programs that, that they are entitled to that don't impact their charge. Um, can you talk a little bit about what efforts you and your team have taken? I know you've partnered with CASA and others, um, but is there anything that, that you are going to be doing moving forward uh, to counter some of that? That's a great question. Uh, I think continuing our efforts and, and uh, I am not a lawyer, so I cannot speak specifically to will this actually impact your ability to apply for citizenship and none of our HHS folks can so you know we direct them to the to the legal experts um, and we try to try to get the word out uh, we do have a question now to county county attorney with this new money from the the treasury about how this will specifically impact um, public charge I think it was a little different with the the CRF money because that was there's just more flexibility there. So, so there's, that's, we need to get some better answers. Um, but any think, assistance that, that sure. you can offer or connections that you can make to help reach the community would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, actually connecting a couple dots, your colleagues um, in, that are coordinating the Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar initiative, I mean, that has been an immense success. And then correspondingly within our African-American community and the African-American health program, and the network of our, our black medical professionals that are now, I, I think there's an opportunity for us to directly cross over and cross market uh, some of these programs. I know that we, we do do that. We have booths available uh, at the testing sites. Um, um, and, but I think being more proactive um, in, in seeking folks instead of them coming to us um, may, may be worth looking into uh, and and I know that everybody is is extremely overwhelmed uh, and overworked these days but if there is an opportunity um, or this is a resource issue you know obviously let us know um, the HHS committee earlier today uh, voted to not accept the, the savings plan uh, that was presented by the county executive in favor of beefing up enhancing some of the areas where we know we, we need immediate need right now uh, and something we've all been saying since the beginning is communications and marketing so that we can break through and address some of these potential barriers up front. Uh, and so that may be an area where, where we may want to invest further. Um, the uh, health promotores are doing a really great job of getting the word out regarding the virus. Um, and so maybe they could, they could add this to their portfolio. And last thought, um, I know, uh, we've recently, um, Diane Vu and her team in the Office of Community Partnership is now re-engaged um, and we're resurrecting the census team um, who are literally going to be going door to door. Um, I think another opportunity to ride that wave and let residents know what's available to them and where to go for help. So just some random thoughts, but wanted to express my appreciation. Thank you, that's very helpful. And I do think that the door to door is, is key. Uh, to, to reaching these households. The webinars and with the technology issues and access to the internet, it's just, it's not, it's not working uh, in the way that we need it to. So thank you for that. And, and I'll correct the record, uh, Chair Albernaz, your thoughts uh, are never random, they're holistic. Uh, and just trying to make government in its uh, entirety work well, right? And work together. So there you go. Um, Council Member Friedson, speaking of holistic. I thought you were going to say, speaking of people with random thoughts, my <laughs> dear friend and colleague, Councilman Um First of all, thank you for this. Thank you for all of your work. This has been an incredibly challenging time. I, I will uh, note there was a comment about the point in time survey uh, last time, which I participated in as well. I was sorry that we all weren't able to do it this time, given the dynamic. It's, it's a challenging night. Uh, for sure, but uh, a sobering one and an important one for, for us to uh, you know, walk at least for a few hours in the shoes that you and your team uh, walk in uh, on a daily basis trying to address the significant challenges that our residents face. I appreciate the fact that Councilmember Glass uh, was, was able to, to do it on our behalf, uh, you know, and, and, and to keep the numbers down, but to make sure that we were, uh, you know, brought in and aware of uh, the results of that. Also want to thank you for all your work, similarly to Council Member Albernaz, or Chair Albernaz, uh, you know, in responding to issues that, that come up. Your team has been really responsive and, and helpful. I know you get 
a lot of requests and a lot of uh, concerns and a lot of issues. And, uh, and these are wraparound service type of challenges. These are not uh, easy constituent issues and, and simple and, and, and quick uh, solutions. And I would uh, thank Linda McMillan, who's on here too, who has uh, you know been a godsend to, to our office on these issues uh, as well, navigating them. So I just wanted to note that. Just quick question on this, a couple things. One, on the, the $20 million, the applications ended in November, 9,000 applications, obviously, you know, tons of need. Do, do we have an expectation of when all of that funding will fully be expended? I know there's a lot of administrative challenges and you talked about that uh, a bit earlier, but is there a point of time that we would expect for all of that funding to be uh, expended? Soon. Soon. soon like <laughs> next week, is soon like uh, next month, next year. Uh, we're getting very close. I, I would say that probably by the end of the month, we'll, we'll be close to 80 to 90%. Uh, we are still getting a, a fair amount of denials or having a hard time reaching people. Uh, even the folks that we have sent the conditional approvals to, uh, not everyone is reaching back out or sometimes when they do reach back out, they have already resolved their issue and they've paid off their, their amount. So, we can still spend the money. We actually have until the end of the year now to, to spend that money. So uh, I think it's actually, it actually could be a benefit that we have a little bit of wiggle room uh, to be able to continue to provide assistance. But yeah, I feel yeah. I feel confident by the end of the month we'll, we'll be uh, at or above 80%. Okay. So, I mean, I, I agree that the, the benefit of having the CARES Act funding be available through the end of the calendar year is a benefit. It doesn't change the need, obviously, that's out there. And I think the, the challenge that we all have is this question of how do you get the money out as quickly as possible, make sure it's getting to the people who need it the most. That's not an easy dynamic. There's some administrative uh, challenges and, you know, connections that we need, you know, you know, in terms of hearing back. So it's part of the issue. I mean, it sounds like some of it is the issues have been resolved in other ways, which is a positive. That would be a great response if they, you know, there was a need and the need was fulfilled. What is the rest of it? That there, there's conditional approvals. You, you've made conditional approvals for all 20 million. You're now reaching out and trying to work through with, you know, these on a case by case basis. And there's a, there, there's a challenge with hearing back or with providing documentation on the back end. Yeah, it's not so much the documentation, it's just reaching people uh, and and them demonstrating that, them letting us know that they're, they're still in need. We have fully committed the 20 million through those conditional approvals. We did that prior to um, the end of December with the original deadline. Uh, it's just some people are, we've got a lot of returned uh, letters of approval. People may have moved, they may have, just resolved it on their own. I think a lot of people continue to feel a lot of pressure from the landlord. And even though there is a moratorium on evictions, that doesn't stop the the harassment and the and the, the letters and the pressure coming from the landlord. So I think that some people have just moved uh, to a to a new location and we haven't been able to locate them. Okay, and of the so there's nine thousand applications, twenty million basically has been committed, but you're trying to figure out a way to reach it, is there like a waiting list or a group of people that of the 9,000 that were, would have been, would be eligible if there was money available at the end and they're kind of in the next stage of this or did you divvy up the 20 million amongst those who qualified under the 9,000 applications? Yeah. So the 20 million is from the 9,000 applications. It should be noted that there was also a fair amount of duplicate applications. So it wasn't actually 9,000 households that it were that applied, we received 9,000 applications. Uh, and then we had about a 30% denial rate because people didn't, the primary reason was that they didn't actually owe any rents, that they were not in arrears. Uh, we had people apply from, that were out of county, that were from Montgomery County, Pennsylvania or Montgomery County, Ohio, uh, that, just, that just weren't eligible. There is a wait list. Um, we do, people can call 311 and they can get on the wait list. I believe the last time I checked, there was about 2,500 households on the wait list, and we have not screened them. We don't know if they're eligible. It's really just they are expressing interest. Um, 
And is there a thought at some point, I mean, if you're going to get to 80 percent and there, you know, at a certain point you can't reach people, about what point you start activating the wait list? Because obviously the people on the wait list are in significant need, I'm sure a lot of them as well. Is there a point at which that will take place, a timing yeah. where you transition to that part of the process? Yeah, we will likely do that when we start the new program with the 31.4 million from the treasury. We will go to the wait list first and start there. Okay, and then the 31 million, how, how at what point do you expect money to actually start going out the door? It sounds like the first part would be going through the applications already received and directing the funding for that. You'll then launch a new application process. Is there a time at which you would expect based on that of when the, all the 31 million would be expended or a certain percentage of the 31 million expended? Well, we have until the end of the calendar year to spend the 31 million. Um, we need to have spent 65% of it within the first six months. I'm looking to my colleagues, make sure I got this right. Okay, they're shaking their heads, yes. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think we hope to be able to start this in mid-March. Uh, as I said before, we, we have to come up with a better way of getting people to apply online, and that allows us to be able to track it to process faster, because that's the biggest delay. It's just the processing. The processing takes a very long time for us to, to get through that. So okay. we're hoping that's with this good. new application, if we spend I'm, a little more time on the front. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I will say the, in the, the, the challenges with the time and the processing is not unique to, to you and to this particular grant program, that has been a huge challenge for all of the programs. Uh, so if there is a way to create a better intake and process, a better technological platform, one that is accessible to the people who we actually need to reach, which is an important piece of this uh, as well, then you know, I hope that we will dedicate the staff time and financial resources needed to make that happen because people need money, they need it yesterday, they need help, they need support, and uh, you know, it's challenging, I know, for all of us to see resources that are available and desperate needs that exist and uh, you know, a challenge in terms of the timing of, of connecting those two dots. So appreciate your work to try to expedite it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Truly. I would also just add quickly, um, as Amanda pointed out earlier, we are still waiting on the final guidance from the Treasury Department. So hopefully, that, as she said, hopefully, you know, they're saying it's coming shortly. Um, hopefully that shortly will be really shortly and we will need to finalize document that we need and all of our processing uh, once we have that. But we are still aiming, like Amanda said, for mid-March. Okay, uh, well, thank you all for, for those questions and, and comments. And Ms. Branda, thank you also as, as part of the CEFA team. Um, and I, I believe, Ms. McMillan, we, we have uh, reached an inflection point, a decision point, yes. right? Yes, okay. so, so um, this was introduced at the council on Tuesday. Normally we would wait until we have a public hearing and then come to committee, but the committee fortunately was scheduled for today. So if the joint committee wanted to make a recommendation uh, to approve the $31 million special appropriation, then it could go to the council for public hearing and action on the 23rd. Uh, so moved. Second. There you go. Uh, all those in favor of moving the $31 million to the full council for recommendation? Excellent. Unanimous by all those present. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Harris and your team. Uh, and we'll send this to full council when we return in two weeks or in two weeks time. Uh, now we are going to community development block grant conversation. Correct? Yes. Mr. Demaray. And this is, um, yeah. One of the issues about having conflicting information come from your federal agencies over time. So this is really to inform the committee of a funding change that uh, DHCA has worked through uh, to make sure that we're properly expending different sources of funds. But I'll, I'll let them uh, give you the summary. And I see uh, Director Nagam has joined us. Uh, so who, uh, whichever one of you wants to take the lead and explain the situation that we are in. 
Sure, I can I can start and then Frank can chime in uh, to fill in the, the blanks. So if you remember uh, last year, uh, the council had appropriated 2,555,102 for the CDBG CARES Act money that we received from HUD. And out of that 1,955,102 was slated for rental assistance and which we intended to use through HOC's rental assistance program. And when we started the program, of course, these are CDBG funds. We have to live by CDBG regulations. We have to look at uh, tenants' income certification. We had to see whether or not they had, uh, you know, experienced COVID-19 related loss. So we received only a handful of applications during the first rollout of the program through HOC. So we, they basically approved maybe eight applications in total. So then we reached out to HUD and they represented to us, well, you can allow the tenants to self-certify their income. You can allow tenants to self-certify their COVID-19 related loss. So then we relaunched that program under the new premise. And uh, now since that time, the program has closed. HOC was able to help 606 uh, households or tenants per se. Uh, and they, they, they did use the money you know, from their own sources. We still need to reimburse them. Then in the in meantime, while they were closing out the program, if you remember, uh, DSCA did receive another round of uh, $4.2 million of CDBG funds under the CARES Act round three. So at that point, we reached out to HUD to f see whether or not the first guidance they gave us would apply to the new funds. Then HUD local field office reached out to HUD headquarters and they said, wait, 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 you have to, you, you cannot have tenants self-certify their income. You have to live by CDBG regulations. You have to look at their pay stubs or tax returns or employment letters. So the, since that time, the program was already launched the second time around and the program had almost closed. So since we didn't want to reinvent the wheel and we didn't want to go back and tell the tenants, look, you know, we can't give you the money. We worked with OMB to see what other parts of money we could use to swap the rental assistance uh, commitments that HOC has made. So DSCA did find some money within their own budget uh, through excess rental assistance payments that came in through, through the uh, recordation tax. So our plans to swap HOC's CDBG rental assistance program money with the, the rental assistance that we have within the HIF program. So in short, the CDBG rental assistance money that we currently received, you know, from the round one would still be used for rental assistance and it will be administered by HHS and DSCA will work with them in terms of the program uh, outline and the uh, outreach and, and marketing. But these are some of the nuances that we have with CDBG funds. And I know that we have been talking about $31.4 million. The state money that we received, $3.4 million in, in CDBG rental assistance, which HHS is also administering, we need to follow CDBG regulations. For $4.2 million is the same equation here. We have to follow CDBG regulations. And not to just fast forward too much, if Biden's administration is... Uh, is uh, able to pass the new financial package, there may be additional rental assistance coming to the states, but then it remains to be seen as in the flow through the US Treasury or is going to come through HUD. So we have made a point with different senators, with the Montgomery County Congressional Delegation, that, and I'm sure you know the other leaders within the Congress are hearing from their uh, constituents as well that CDBG regulations are difficult to, to comply with. And when we are talking about reaching out to tenants quickly, giving them the assistance, and we ask them, well, yeah, we'll give you the assistance, but you have to give us your pay stuff, show us your tax returns, show us the, the data. And that's a, basically a non-starter when you're trying to reach out to the tenants. So hopefully people will be, are hearing us and you know our you know political leaders and hopefully Congress will make some adjustment 
uh, going forward in these programs and make it easier to administer. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, well, you, you, you just gave, I think, a, a really good debrief from the financial aspect, the, the geopolitical aspect, and everything. So you answered all of my questions. Uh, I don't know if anybody <laughs> else has any. Uh, yeah, Chair Reamer. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm, I, I was under the impression that this was a program of Montgomery County's design, uh, but, uh, but then in your comments just now, you said you were hoping Congress would change some of the eligibility. What... Uh, is, is this just a general CDBG Correct. restriction and you tried to design a specific program that we could implement, but it would have to be consistent with those design requirements. And then it turned out not to uh, be workable. What were some of the, remind me some of the documentation, you know, so, requirements. So under the CDBG regulations, of course, that, you know, the household income cannot exceed 80% of AMI. The, under CDBG regulations, we have to income certify that tenant. We have to look at their pay stub, employment, or if they were laid off or hours were cut, some kind of evidence, or look at their tax returns. So it's a whole nine yards that we need to follow through for CDBG regulations, as opposed to just getting a simple certification from a tenant. Yes, you know, they their income, you know, uh, is eligible under the program. They experienced COVID-19 related loss. Here we have to document everything and that slows down the, the entire process. So it's not just a Montgomery County issue. I'm hearing that, you know, our, our congressional leadership uh, in DC, they are hitting the same thing from other parts of the country. Everyone but, has been the but, same issue. But did other parts of the country do the same program? Well, most of the uh, folks who use CDBG funds for the rental assistance, then they, they are using, they are having the same issue. Okay. The CDBG rental assistance. So whether it's Prince George's County or, or DC, they were having the same issue in getting the money out. But so it, that's what's, what we, what's the distinction between the micro enterprise and the rental assistance? I mean, how much? Oh, okay. So as I alluded to my comments, uh, you know, originally, out of 2,955,102 money that we received under CARES Act for uh, round one, we used uh, about a million dollars for the micro enterprise program. So micro enterprise program under CDBG, again, this is the CDBG money. Under CDBG regulations, micro enterprise is defined as a business with five or fewer employees. So we had to income certify the business. We had to look at their tax returns and made sure that they met the CDBG requirements. So those were on the business side. And Montgomery County was only a handful of jurisdictions across the country who used that round one CARES Act money this way. Besides uh, Montgomery County, D.C., North Carolina, Washington State, Seattle, uh, and maybe a couple of other jurisdictions use this and money this way. Were we able to get that money out? Yes. Uh, we, we were anticipating to help only 100 businesses. In the end, we were able to help 177 businesses throughout the county, and some of the businesses were along the purple line as well. Okay. So the micro-enterprise money went out reasonably well? Is that yes. Right. Yes. And then it was the rental assistance that turned out to be more problematic. Correct. Correct. Okay, that's helpful. Okay. Well, I, you know, I think it's a testament to the critical importance of administration and just making sure that when we have models at work, that we fund those, and um, you know, just that some of these issues can really catch us. You know, it's like you, you put a federal requirement in there and suddenly you can't get the money out. And uh, so, you know, it's just uh, having simple s systems to administer. It seems like it's really an advantage. Um, okay, thanks. Sure. Trying to put simple systems in, in crises and emergencies sometimes uh, gets us in this situation a few months later or a year down down the road trying to to course correct, uh, but hopefully 
uh, the uh, new administration will be receptive to the needs of, of our county and other similar counties. And uh, I see you nodding. So that's clearly where the conversation is going on uh, down on Pennsylvania Avenue. So um, we'll, we'll get more updates as 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 you get them. Uh, Council Member Friedson. Thanks. I just wanted to harp on this quickly. First of all, I, you know, I think the restrictions are well intended. You know, we ran into this in the early part of the pandemic as well, particularly with the business assistance. And we ended up with the best of intentions, putting on certain restrictions that actually made it nearly impossible for the very people we were trying to target to actually qualify. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I think learned our lesson a little bit on that. So uh, that, that's a challenge. It's always going to be a challenge finding that right balance between, you know, putting restrictions in place to make sure, you know, the support is targeted to the places and people uh, where we uh, want it, where it's needed the most, but also not, you know, putting up roadblocks for those very people. Uh, as well as it's not an easy uh, uh, dynamic. But I'm, I'm curious, I was going to ask about the other jurisdictions. Um, you know, I understand other jurisdictions are, are frustrated by this too. Two questions. One, does that mean that none of this money has been able to go out or has just been slower than we would uh, expect based on these restrictions? And, and, and two, are other jurisdictions, are they frustrated by it? Is there a an effort by localities across the state and across the country to be lobbying with one voice. You know, we have MAKO and NACO and, you know, other organizations that have been, you know, lo lobbying for, 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 for different changes. Yeah. Could you just, you know, explain that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'm sure NACO is uh, making, you know, the same comments known to the congressional delegation. Uh, I do not have that data on, how much of CDBG rent assistance by other jurisdictions has been spent, but uh, they have their own challenges. That's what we learned through the process. Uh, so it remains to be seen what all things the Congress will do to make lives easy. But when it comes to, you know, federal regulations, especially with CDBG regulations, they're, they're onerous and everyone will agree with that. And you have to look at a lot of documentation before you can income verify a tenant. So let me answer your first part of the, of the, of the question. The money has been uh, committed. So HOC has spent the money now. So between rental assistance and the admin, they have spent probably million three. So which we are going to reimburse them as we receive the invoices from them from the rental assistance, extra money that we have within our budget. So in short, that rental assistance, CDBG rental assistance that we had originally for HOC's rental assistance program would still be used for rental assistance going forward because that's what the money is slated for. Yes, we have to follow CDBG regulations unless Congress you know, comes back and says retroactively that you do not have to worry about uh, uh, income verification. You can allow the tenants to self-certify their income. So we have to follow CDBG regulations in short. So the, mo so the money is gonna be able to be moved out. It's just taking a lot longer than we Correct. expect it to. I mean, that that's the, I mean, it's been taking a long time. And what you're saying is that's based on the federal regulations and we're trying to get them changed. But in the meantime, it's just been a really slow process. But if I could just interrupt, I think the, the issue is that we actually did get the money out, but then when we tried to clarify on the next round of money, HUD said that we had to use the full CDBG rules as opposed to self-certification. So the way this round worked, uh, HOC tried to get the money out under CDBG rules. It did not go out, as Mr. Nagam said, like eight, eight tenants were going to get aid under that effort. So the HUD field office said you could use self-certification. And then HOC went back out, and they did get the money out. But then HUD said, well, you can't use self-certification. So now the money's going back. We'll go back to the CDBG money. We'll go back to... HHS to try to use under the rules, but uh, recordation tax funding that's within the housing initiative fund will be used to uh, pay for that 
first money that we got out thinking that we were using the CDBG money. And so that's the issue. There has to be a funding source change for that uh, million dollars plus that went out to the 600 households. Mr. Nagam can correct me if you yeah. got it. And then we're taking yeah. money that we were gonna use for rental assistance out of the the HIF or another rental assistance program. Correct. We're basically backfilling it to the money that already Correct. went out based on the eligibility issues that you know were conflicting from the field yes. office from from HUD, and so you know we, okay, yeah. all right, that makes a little bit more sense to me. Okay, thank you. I that that clarification was helpful. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Thank you. And I think uh, Chair Albernaz, did you? Yeah, just very quickly, Mr. Nagam, this is actually a left-hand turn, and you don't have to answer this. I just want to give you a preview. I'm going to be sending you a notification soon, maybe a letter. I think I've spoken to Council Rimmer about this. We're hearing from a number of uh, industry folks in apartment complexes, as well as through HOC, Victory Housing, that um, are inherently through just the, the virtue of their clientele, the folks that they serve. It may not technically be a senior center, uh, but the vast majority of the residents that reside in some of these facilities are seniors. Um, but the building maintenance workers that work in these buildings are not considered in the 1A or B category. Uh, and so there's an interest in having a discussion and conversation because these folks are in and out of uh, rooms uh, and you know, obviously maintaining these facilities and for everyone's safety, there's an interest in seeing, there aren't enough vaccines period right now. Uh, and to council members Reamer's point, yes, I've been dealing with the issue uh, that we've all been dealing with. Um, but I will be following up with you on this, Mr. Nagam. I know that um, uh, you've been very helpful in so many other areas and I'm hoping you can be with this issue as well. So we'll follow up with your office soon. Sure. and. The, uh... Since you mentioned that point, so you may want to keep uh, HHS in the loop because they are the ones, you know, uh, who will be uh, taking the lead on that issue. Yes, it's a joint thing. And I, I chair the HHS committee since this is a joint committee session. The, the notification will be going to both of you. Sure. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, I don't see any other comments. So, um, Director Nagam, thank you very much, and and, uh, and, and Mr. Demare uh, for for this update. And just keep us posted on those conversations with our federal partners uh, and also uh, regional neighbors as well to see what changes are going to come and how quickly we can make them. Okay. Uh, last on the agenda is an update on. Uh, the appropriation that we passed a, a little while ago uh, on finding a new location for uh, a warming center for uh, for our services to end and prevent homelessness, uh, those who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, we know that uh, this has been um, a rocky road over the last two years, uh, and we have expanded our, our homeless shelters to a number of, of recreation centers uh, to accommodate the social distance needed for COVID. Uh, we have one of our uh, largest providers, nonprofit providers here, uh, using temporary space loaned to us by the great city of Rockville. Uh, and so with that as the backdrop, we are trying to find uh, another space for uh, for us to, to do right for those who are experiencing homelessness. So uh, with that, I think we are bringing DGS up, Mr. Assan, or I'm not sure who's all here. And it is Mr. Assan. We have Mr. Dice here as well. And, I think and Mr. Dice. He's leading off. Hi there. Hi. It's always nice to see your backdrop. <laughs> um, do you want to give us an update on, on where we are? Well, we're, we, we've made some significant progress, uh, some of which we're happy to discuss uh, in detail with council in an executive session since, uh, or in a closed session since it does require, uh, involve the uh, uh, potential purchase of uh, real estate. Uh, but uh, uh, we are working very closely with our HHS colleagues whom you've already heard from 
this is a priority uh, for the executive and council uh, and on behalf of the residents of the county. So we've been applying a great deal of effort towards that. Uh, to give you more detailed information on that progress, I would recommend we go into a closed session. Okay, well, uh, I, uh, we, we can all appreciate the fact that we need to go into a closed session, signifying that you have made some strides in, in procuring finding a space. Uh, so uh, we can do that in a quick moment. I know uh, Council Member Rice wanted to make a comment. Yeah, well, I just had a question about the status of, and so this is separate from the property itself, but when it comes to uh, the uh, space at Taft and them being moved or some of the folks being moved uh, to temporary space in a hotel, um, what some of the procedures and protections are uh, for other guests as well as for the individuals themselves uh, in terms of security, those kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it certainly is better than being at a place where we had the challenges with the toilets outside, especially in the wintertime. Uh, and so that's great. So there are a lot of good things that are happening as a result of us doing this for uh, our uh, homeless constituency. However, I am very concerned uh, about the risk um, that is posed uh, to them in ensuring their safety. Uh, so if we could talk a little bit about that, and I'm not sure who would be the appropriate person to weigh in on that. Uh, I, I see Amanda is still with us. We, we work very closely with, uh, with HHS uh, at, at other county facilities, for instance, uh, Progress Place. We've, we've done a, a number of modifications to, uh, to that site uh, to expand it, the, the housing and service levels there. But insofar as uh, hotels and other facilities are concerned, I'm going to defer to uh, Ms. Harris. Hi, Amanda. Hi. I'm sorry. If you could just repeat your question, no, 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 I no, no, may have been distracted. No, it's, it's okay. Not at all. Thank it's you. not a problem. So, so, I'm, so I'm basically concerned about security for uh -huh. the individuals as we move from Taft into the hotel uh, in a temporary space uh, uh -huh. and just ensuring their safety. Um, many of our uh, guests are at risk uh, for a number of things. And so, we, we just want to make sure that they're protected, um, that they have the same level of protection that typically is afforded if we had uh, our own space, a la a Taft. And so, uh, because it is a hotel, has there been conversation around stepping up to make sure that security is there uh, to afford the same safety and security, not only for uh, the homeless individuals themselves, but also for the staff that are serving them? Sure. So, yes, I can answer that. Uh, yes, absolutely. That is part of the plan is to bring uh, the services and the security on site. Uh, it should be noted that we have already been using hotels, uh, not to the extent that we would to temporarily house um, as many people that are that are at Taft. But uh, the hotels that we are using, we've had good good success at bringing in the security, doing the meal delivery, doing the checks. Uh, at one of the hotels that we're using, we actually have a staff member that is currently living there six days a week. So she is the on-site support and that has been incredibly helpful uh, to have that, that presence there. So yes, it is, it's a, it is a little harder, uh, but in many ways it is actually safer and uh, you're far less likely to spread the virus if you are in your own room rather than in the large congregate setting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm very happy to see some of the benefits and I know that we'll be saving some money in terms of the costs associated with rental paying to Rockville versus what we're doing here. So hopefully we can utilize some of that to offset some of the additional staffing and security that we may need in this situation. So it should make it uh, uh, hopefully revenue neutral, if not so re revenue positive. I would just encourage you to continue to make sure that you're strategizing with uh, your providers, namely MCCH and others, to make sure that whatever plan you come up with uh, uh, is, is one that they're also comfortable with since they're the ones who know their uh, constituency and know what some of those needs may be. So I encourage that. I know that you guys always talk. And so, you know, we know that that's going to happen. So just, just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you for acknowledging that and looking forward to the conversation in closed session as well. 
Thank you. Smart comment. So let's go to closed session. Uh, I need a motion to, uh, to send us into a closed session to consider acquisition of real property for a uh, public purpose and matters directly related hereto pursuant to Maryland Code General Provisions, Article 3-305B3. Do I have so a moved. motion? Second. Uh, moved by Councilmember Rice, seconded by Councilmember Reamer. Show of hands. Unanimous by all those here. Um, and then thank you very much. And we're going to go into closed session.